Um, my name is Dottie Goebel. I work at the um, NIHR Evaluation Trials and Studies Coordinating Centre. We call it NETS for short. It's much easier than saying all of that. Quite a mouthful. Um, I currently work in the team that develops um, commissioning um, advertising briefs um, and seem to be moving to the totally other end of the spectrum where we publish and disseminate information to evidence users. So I'm going right from the front end of the process to the back. Um, and in my previous life, I've worked um, managing a health and wellbeing board at um, Southampton City Council. So I've kind of got some understanding of how social care works as well. Um, so we try and sort of like make sure that we're now sort of like, you know, from some of the things that um, Martin was saying, we're, we're really kind of like trying to focus and bring together our portfolio for social care and try and interact much more with the evidence users. So hopefully that comes through from the slides that I'm looking at. No, we haven't got long, but I'm briefly going to give you a feel for um, an introduction to our programmes, a little bit more information, but probably not as much as you'd like, so um, always chances to have a look and speak to people and speak to me later. Um, give you a bit of an outline of our funding processes, what happens way before you even see an advert on, this, on, the, on our website, um, your likely experiences when you apply, if you've got a funding project that's ongoing, um, and what happens after your study finishes. Um, there will also be information about our dissemination um, and kind of really some hints and tips about applications, I think, is a really important bit. Um, I think there'll be chances later on in the system and the day to look at that, but just to give you that flavour of what we're really looking for um, at the NHR. So, very briefly, our programmes. Martin's already touched on these, um, and I'll just go through them very briefly. Um, the Public Health Research Programme is the one that's kind of furthest away from the NHS setting. This is really looking um, at what is, um, you know, interventions and improvements that will improve the general health of the public and reduce health inequalities. There's a relatively small budget here, about six million um, within the year, um, and there is probably some potential for some social care studies, um, and I've got an example that I'll give you a little bit later on. Um, as already mentioned, efficacy and mechanism evaluation is probably the least and the furthest away from um, social care research. It's really about after first in man um, has been proven, um, and it's really bridging that pre-clinical gap. So um, it's a joint um, MRC partnership um, funded, and about sort of 10, 12 million, including the sort of researcher-led um, area. Then we've got um, the Health Technology Assessment Programme, um, which is really looking right at the coalface, hoping to sort of like evidence things that are directly relevant to um, clinicians and professionals within the, within the health and social care system. We are looking to um, look at the clinical and cost effectiveness <coughs> of health treatments and tests, and it's very much about the front line comparing what works currently now in usual care against some evidence-based um, initiatives or interventions that might show some improvement, something we could stop doing in the NHS just as much as what we could start doing. So it's very much um, a test about what works best and what we can stop. Then the one that, the programme that's primarily um, got a lot of health and um, social care activity in it is the health services and delivery research. Um, and this primarily looks at the quality and accessibility um, and how people can access services and how we can improve um, the organisation of health services across um, the health and social care system. We primarily have three work streams um, at NETS. Um, we have um, a researcher-led work stream um, that actually is an open call for funding. I, this, there's, a, there's quite a lot of competition in this area, so any open research um, call could potentially have 50, 60 applications each round, and there's three each year for each programme. So um, there's a lot of competition there, so if you apply to that, you've actually got to can really justify and demonstrate that your project and your application is one that um, has some real sound rationale um, and has some basis and evidence. So all those things are really important going through. We also, ha also have a commissioned work stream where the importance and the efficacy and the need for that research has already been established through a long process. And I'll show you a little bit about what goes on in that sort of first stages of the process. But we're really looking there to identify the evidence gaps 
um, and to stimulate that market failure, which is around just making sure that evidence that, and research that otherwise probably wouldn't take place because it's not something that's, that's sexy in industry or something that people will kind of feel is, in, is important will happen because actually it makes a significant difference to delivery in the health and social care service. We also um, have themed calls, and I understand that Ben's going to talk a little bit about that, but each year we tend to have one to two um, themed calls. Previous years we've had things around dementia, primary care, and the, the issue that's worth noting within the themed calls programme is that these um, topics that we identify remain a, a priority, and it's really important because if, if you're trying to really sort of like demonstrate and show that your application is important, it's worth thinking about where our priorities lie within our organisation. So that's something worth noting. And we're also working on a, a new way of, kind of commissioning our services that bridges the gap between the researcher-led stuff that um, is perhaps you know, in the higher competition and the commission stuff where the need is already established. And we're having kind of more focused and more strategic commissioning that's starting next year. So it's worth <coughs> looking out for that because one of the areas that we're starting to develop is on social care. It's not going to be... Um, coming around quickly, but it's something that's certainly worth looking for. It's going to be a bit of a slow burner because there's quite a lot more work that needs to be done to establish you know, where the gaps are, where the capacity is, and where we need to focus our attention. But that's something, if you're interested in, in research that's already established in importance, then it's certainly worth looking at, out for that. So what makes a good research question as far as we're concerned? I'll try and whiz through these because I think that um, there'll be opportunities later to, to look at this. But it's really about importance um, to both patients and society is really significant. Um, it needs to be very relevant within the system. It needs to be supported by evidence. So something that hasn't got any evidence base is something we're much less likely to um, fund or even consider. It needs to have that sort of high level of scientific quality and to be proven to have some feasibility. So maybe some kind of pilot or assessment um, is quite important to show and establish that what you're going to look at has got some legs. Um, timeliness is really important because actually sometimes research projects can take so long in terms of the study that actually by the time three, four years along the line where um, someone has already um, completed something or you know a study has come through and the recommendations are out, practice may have changed. And so it's really important that actually the, the timeliness of your study is um, demonstrated. And the research question needs to be really clearly and well defined. So you need to show that you will answer the question that it's important and the fact that you know your evidence will help others. So, funding research. When we're um, prioritising research, we look at three main areas to decide how important and how needed and science-added the um, application is. So we look at the burden of disease, um, and this primarily is around the frequency and the severity of the disease. We look at the health service itself, actually how it's currently operating, what the current um, structure is, and also you know, what the current practice is. We look at the evidence gap, and to see, you know, based on the time that it would take for the evidence to come around, actually is this an important question, and how important is the subject area? So this is just kind of to give you a bit of a flavour of the whole cycle for commissioning um, a research study and the fact that, you know, to demonstrate how much time it can actually take. So if you look at that whole thing, the red dot is potentially where if you were a researcher-led applicant where you'd come in. So where we commission um, projects coming through the system, there's a whole process that takes place to identify how important and the, and the, the need of the research that's taking place. Um, and then once you submit your application after the red dot, that's the whole application and funding process that takes place. And there are a number of stages. There's a stage one where you put your first sort of idea through the system. The board looks at that and will give you feedback um, and invite you to stage two if your application is successful at that level. Then we'll go to um, look at, speak to experts and actually identify and make sure that there's no overlaps um, with current activity and research. Then your process will, and your application will come back to the board and they'll decide actually if they think that your um, application is relevant um, and they need 
will be going forward. And they'll look at the post changes and the funding changes that will happen after that. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the feedback that comes through from um, the board as well. So what happens after the board? So you may well get some fund with changes um, feedback. They'll look at the science, the finance and the intellectual property and, and give you a feel for whether um, there are some issues that you need to address still. But actually, you know, your funding is going to go through. There's some key steps to the startup around plans and protocols and ethics that still need to come through after that process. Um, it's really important that we're going to monitor the projects to maximise success, so that's an area that I'll touch on a little bit. But we want to ensure that the question that you've proposed you're going to address is answered and that you're going to deliver that um, project on time and to budget. We look at um, monthly data and we do six-month progress checks. Sometimes if there's a problem or there are some concerns with any of the studies that are going on, we do hub visits. Um, and we review the progress against the recruitment and outcomes that are proposed. Just very briefly, just to sort of highlight that you know, there are various different ways about what success might look like, um, and impact is really important um, for um, NETS. We look at you know, potentially what comes out in the press, press releases are really important, what journals, actually you know, what information is out there, but the really critical bit is about making sure that evidence users can get hold of the information and change practice. That's a really fundamental element of uh, what we look at and what we want to see coming through any research study. Um, so thinking about innovative, 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 I can't even speak, ways that you can actually get to your evidence users is really important and how you can get your study outcomes to the people that need to know about it. So a little bit about the net social care portfolio. We've currently got about 30 plus active projects and completed projects. Since 2001, we've had about £14 million worth of social care linked studies, and about 60% of those have been in the last five years. So there's certainly been a growing portfolio of social care studies. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight there is that most studies are based either in London and the North and the Midlands, and there is some evidence to suggest that um, where research takes place, there's a better quality of care, and there's, a, there's often a clear link. So, you know, we, we want to see our portfolio expanding to other areas of the country as well. Um, something that's already been mentioned, that over 90% of our studies within our portfolio are within the health services and delivery research area and it is the most likely programme for funding opportunities for your area. A lot of the common, common themes that you'll see already within our system are around transition of care, multidisciplinary and integrated care teams, social care commissioning and care home settings. So they're the areas that we see a lot of. So um, obviously you would need to look and make sure that your idea or your research topic isn't something that we've already got in the system. Um, or otherwise you can link to that current evidence to actually try and see, well, well, how can we move on from that? Where is the next step um, going forward um, in the future? So I've got a few social care examples. I'm just thinking about time. How much time have I got, Martin? Just sort of whether we want me to move on quick or not. I can give a little bit more detail about some of these. Yeah? Alright? Okay. Um, so just a couple of examples within the health um, and service delivery um, programme. The first one um, is primarily around um, use of services within care homes. And I thought it was quite interesting because it's a realist evaluation which looks at you know, what works, for whom, in what circumstances, um, in what respects does that work, and to what extent and why. So it was quite interesting. So as you can see, the sort of like title is around looking at those features and mechanisms that resulted in effective working in residential settings. Um, the chief investigator was Professor Claire Goodman, who's at the University of Hertfordshire. And just very briefly, I'll give you a sort of an outline of the fact that they were looking at really picking out what the active ingredients are for positive health outcomes. And this is it. I mean, one of the, the sort of left-hand corner that Martin sort of highlighted on one of his previous slides was about outcomes and that's a really important area um, at NETS for us to focus on. We want to see that there are going to be outcomes coming through and what those outcomes are that are impacted by the study um, that you're looking at. There were three phases. Um, the first one was around undertaking interviews and reviewing the evidence. 
The second phase was around developing theories around what works and what's effective delivery of services in um, residential settings. And the last phase was around testing their theories at 12 sites, tracking the care of patients over 12 months. So it was quite an in-depth um, study. One of their key findings was around um, the fact that um, NHS and care staff and GPs can all work well together, but really primarily they need to be, that needs to be endorsed as important. That's sort of like joint working um, needs to be sort of understood and clarified by whichever setting they were in. Some of the key factors in terms of um, success within residential settings for uh, patient outcomes was around incentives, protocols, the expertise was needed there and a structured planning system. And they could all lead to improved health outcomes where possible, but these need to be coupled with integration and co-design approaches. So that was quite, you know, the, the outcomes and the conclusions within that are quite tangible um, areas of work. Then um, the second one we got for HS and DR was, a, was from Professor Barbara Hanratty, who's at University of Newcastle. And this was, again, around the transitions um, within um, patient care and primarily around the, for older people at the end of life. And uh, I think one of the things that was sort of like, have been identified and still continue to be a priority that we're working on at NetCC is around end of life care. Those last, that last year, months, days and hours, and it's really a significant area within the social care setting. Um, and within those last um, sort of like year of life or so, people are transferred many times and it's both a high resource cost to um, NHS services and social care services, but also can cause problems and difficulties for patients and carers, understanding the system, understanding the new places that they're going to, um, and impact on their well-being overall. So the study wanted to identify how and why this trans transition takes place. Um, and what impact that had on the health and well-being of the patients and the carers. So they particularly focused on three conditions around lung cancer, heart failure and stroke. And they wanted to understand those patterns of transition and the experiences of the patient and carers at end-of-life care. So there were three phases in this. first phase was around um, quantitative mapping using um, HES data. Um, and starting to sort of like develop an idea of estimated costs of those services that were being used. The second phase was around qualitative and, and, and sort of retrospectively looking at bereaved carers. So quite sensitive area of work, but really important to understand those experiences of people who've been through a system. And they wanted to look at particularly the impact of the transition. And they had some outcomes that they uh, were really important to assess around health, quality of life, um, control of symptoms and the satisfaction of the services that they were going through. Um, and then phase three was another qualitative interview sessions with commissioners and providers. So they had that whole picture um, of the sort of service and the system that people would be going through at all the potential stages as they were moving through. In terms of findings, um, you know, obviously they found out the transitions are quite common um, uh, and very often, shortly before death, people will transfer many times. Um, and the feedback really from patients and carers was, was that they felt the system was very disjointed um, and wasn't always helpful to recognising, identifying or responding to patients' needs. Um, one of their key recommendations was around the fact that it's really important to develop a shared understanding for both the professional, professionals and the carers' role in transition um, and to tr strengthen the skills and voices for patients and carers so that they can have their voice and they can have their say. Um, and man because many of those um, carers are managing that end of life um, care for, for their family member. And, and they can potentially reduce some of that interaction and transition um, or actually improve the experiences when, when the transition is necessary. So that's just a flavour of kind of two of the sort of H S and D R projects that are completed. So you can look at those online and get a feel for them. And I think the other important thing is is, is about when we talk about hints and tips for applicants is about the fact that you need to sort of like think about, understand what happens, what's already happened in the system, what research has already taken place, and build on that evidence base because that's really important. But if you're thinking that your sort of like study area is potentially related to um, another programme. I've got a couple of examples here quickly, from, one from HGA, so the health technology area, and one from PHR. So in terms of 
health technology assessments, we look at things in a very particular way. We, we like to see what we call a PICO, which is around looking at the patient, who, and, and we want to have clarification of exactly who that patient is, what the intervention is that you're proposing, um, what you're comparing that to, because as, as I've said, HGA is all about generally comparing one intervention to another. Um, and what those outcomes for patients will be. What's the primary outcome? What's the major um, issue that you want to address? And what are the, the secondary outcomes or outputs from the study? So this particular one was, a, was actually a feasibility study, and we like that because we want to see the evidence base um, in um, an HGA funding project. And this one was around modifying um, a video feedback intervention for children in a foster care setting um, and actually looking to see how we can improve their mental health outcomes when they have a re reactive attachment disorder. So the patient, for example, here was for children in foster care. Um, and those children in foster care particularly have been diagnosed with um, RAD. The setting was outpatient CAMS. The intervention was around that adapted video feedback intervention, particularly adapting it for children in foster care because of their issues. Um, the comparator was usual care because actually there was no established pathway for children with reactive attachment disorder. A number of outcomes, but the primary one that I identified was around, um, is more of an output in this one. So it was more about developing the intervention, um, assessing what the key implementation parameters were, and then thinking about how successful this study could be. So thinking about how they might engage with local authorities, how easy or difficult and what the barriers might be for recruitment and what consenting strategies might be needed. So I'll stop on that one there just because that gives you a flavour for kind of what we're looking for. And obviously the methods you need to be able to justify and show that you'll be able to complete and answer the question based on the methods that you're proposing. And then the last one that I'm looking at and I've given you an example is around a public health research programme study. And this one was around bathing adaptations um, in homes for older adults. Now, this particular one um, was recognised the fact that, you know, following the sort of, well, there's already work that happens in local authorities around housing adaptations within a physical environment, um, and the barriers within a physical environment, you know, can actually cause real problems for people's everyday activities, their loss of independence, and their functional decline may be sort of like a direct consequence of not being able to operate in their own home. So, obviously, the CARE Act, I don't need to tell you anything about the CARE Act, um, but you know, it's, it's already been sort of like identified that that need um, is, is very clear. And um, housing adaptations have been picked up as one of the 10 most pro promising prevention um, interventions within um, this environment. So, this adaptation was looking at whether bathing facilities and adaptations to those bathing facilities could improve the health status and quality of life of adults and their carers. And uh, the particular issue in this one was about the fact that would reduced waiting times actually result in better outcomes for those people um, and actually reduced costs within health and social care services. Um, so that was kind of like the, really the important bit around will waiting improve um, costs and outcomes. So obviously the setting is house, housing adaptation <coughs> services. There were four sites, and they particularly identified that they wanted to use those sites that were, had an excess waiting time of four months, so that actually they could really pinpoint whether a faster service made a difference for people using that service. Um, and their outcomes that they were looking at was around, around physical health, which was their primary outcome, mental health, quality of life, daily living, falls, and use of services. Now that's an ongoing trial, so the results of that we haven't, um, we're not expecting until 2021 and later. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, it gives you that feel about how you can actually pinpoint all the key areas of the, of the research, and it's really critical that what we get out of that is a clear question with potential answers that you will get from the design of the study. So I think Martin's already picked on some of these, so I won't labour on them too much, but the fact that we've got the shift for, um, of policy at the Department of Health or the DUSC, um, and, and the really important area is about the fact that you need to demonstrate that applied research. Um, capacity is something that, that Martin's already highlighted as well, um, and you know, that's the sort of really critical stuff that will be stages that will develop that culture of research in the, in the social care um, setting. 
And, and it sort of like highlights that difficulty that we have in actually doing research in this area because it's sensitive, because it's difficult, you know. It doesn't mean to say that we don't do it, it's just finding ways around it. You know, health and social, health and um, services and, and delivery research has got a small programme, but there is potential in other areas, but that's still a challenge. Um, and health technology assessment, where there is a much higher budget, um, then high, there's much higher numbers of applications, certainly in the research led area. So there's the competitiveness there that you, will, that you will experience that makes it harder for you to get funding. But it's not insurmountable, and it's things that you know, we need to try and address as we go through. But NETS is open for business for social care research. We, we're keen to expand on our social care portfolio. Um, we have got this wider commissioning focus um, where we hope to be looking at social care. It's work in progress and we hope to see it coming up on, in the next sort of 12 to 18 months or so. So keep a look out for that. And the, the important thing is that if you are putting an application through, make sure you build on the current evidence. You know, collaborate with people who've had experience of funding already um, and speak to the funding team at our, our central office. So very quickly, I've probably got a couple of slides left around hints and tips for applicants. Um, we want to make sure that we see much more, you know, more good quality research applications. We want them to be easy to read, good quality. I mean, the standard stuff that you, you'd expect, but, but make sure you allow time to do all those things. You know, structure your application well. And the, the really critical point there is around ensuring that you have a very strong justification for the topic or issue that you're proposing. Um, and really take your time to make sure that that is there. Be clear about how you meet the requirements. The key points for success that we really want to see coming through is first, obviously, apply to the relevant programme. Check that you fit to the remit. Uh, Martin's already highlighted about using the sort of resources out there, the RDS and the clinical trials units, our guidance online. That's all really important that you make sure that, that that's all available and that you make use of those resources. Develop a good team of experts. That's one thing I'd really say is important in an application coming through um, to one of our funding boards. I think we want to see that you've got the relevant skills that are needed to answer the question. Patient involvement is really critical, and co-production in your design of your study is really helpful. And we want to see that embedded across your application. Think about ways of engaging your users, both during your design, but particularly about how are you going to disseminate that information in a way that will get to your users and people who need to know the outcomes from your um, findings. And then lastly, it's just there are other ways of getting involved that will actually give you a good feeling for what's going on. We, we welcome suggestions on research questions, and that's, there's a link on there if you, when you look at the slides. We want people to sign up to be reviewers because looking at applications and looking at our briefs gives you a good feeling for what um, is coming through the system and also how we like to see things laid out. So that will always help. Um, and actually, you can become a panel of board member, and that's an annual process. So um, I think that's just going through the system now. But that, you know, all of these experiences give you a good feeling for what we're looking for in a, in a good application. There's lots of stuff online, so I would say look on there, look for the guidance. There's webinars for a particular call, as and when they come up. There's lots of hints and tips that will help you. Um, and if you're not sure, just speak to the relevant person in the programme team, and I put a link up there as well to all our different contacts. That's it, thank you.